Welcome to the Docketing Excellence webinar series, which is sponsored by Black Hills IP and the SLW Institute. Black Hills IP is an accurate, efficient, and cost-effective U.S.-based IP docketing paralegal and paralegal service provider that focuses on using technology and automation to provide the highest quality levels available today. The SLW Institute is an educational group created by the Schwegman Lundberg Wistner firm, which aims to provide insightful and useful information to the IP community. For this webinar series, we've pooled together docketing experts and managers from the Schwegman firm, Black Hills IP, and their respective clients and customers to help educate on key docketing challenges and issues and share best practices on how to overcome them. The Docketing Excellence webinar series is free. To listen to our past webinars or to register for future webinars, go to the tab for Our Educational Resources on the Black Hills IP website, which is www.blackhillsip.com. The webinar that we are presenting today is the fifth in the trademark docketing webinar series that we've been doing all this year. And it's going to be the first of two webinars focused on how to manage the transfer of large trademark portfolios. We've allowed time for questions at the end of the webinar. Questions can be submitted using the question box on the control panel on the right-hand side of your browser window. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation, but we will hold those questions until the end and then go through them after the, the program has completed. The presenters today are myself, Shakalatsi Carrion, Ellen Lockwood, and Julie Gillespie. I'm Ann McCracken, the president of Black Hills IP. I'm a patent attorney with 21 years of experience in patent prosecution. I was a part of the Schwegman firm for 10 years. I was also a full-time law professor and directed the patent prosecution program at Franklin Pierce Law Center, which is now the University of New Hampshire, for five years. Z, can you tell the audience about your background? Hello, all. Um, my name is Shakalaski Karian, but a lot of you know me as Z Karian. Um, I've, I did law school in Mexico, and I did my bar exam there, and then I decided I didn't want to be an attorney and what's out there in, in, in life for me. So I come to Minneapolis, and 2005, I started working at Schwegman, and I've been there ever since. Uh, five years ago, I became the docketing manager, and um, eight years ago, working in the docketing department, I think I found out my calling, the, my passion, and my career, which is docketing. Great. Thanks, Z. Ellen, please tell the audience about your background. Hi, I'm Ellen Lockwood, and I just recently um, am happy to say I joined Schwegman's. I've been a paralegal for more than 25 years, most of which has been in uh, law firms and then 17 years um, in-house um, doing intellectual property law, mostly uh, trademarks. Great. And Julie, uh, tell the audience about your background. Hello, everyone. My name is Julie Gillespie, and I have about 25 years of IP experience in both patents and trademarks, foreign and domestic. Uh, in IP, I've done prosecution work, portfolio management, and docketing, and I am currently a docketing specialist with Black Hills IP. Well, thank you all for being here today. I appreciate your time and uh, looking forward to hearing your thoughts. As we said, the program today is on docketing options for managing the transfer of a trademark portfolio. More specifically, we're going to talk about first just a little setting of the groundwork for what do we mean by the term file transfer and transferring portfolios. Then we'll talk about the two main methodologies or approaches to handling a file transfer. Then we'll go over some kind of a checklist of things to consider when you're determining what methodology you're going to use. And finally, the um, end of the program, we'll focus on some real life examples and case studies that we've all worked through and will share with you and hopefully you can benefit from our experiences. Z, can you lead off with uh, talking about what a trademark file transfer is? Yeah, so um, before I say what it is, I did want to 
uh, bring up that a file transfer could be in the context of an acquisition for a company or a new client transferring matters to a new law firm. So, but what is this uh, trademark file transfer? Well, these are matters that are not already in your system, matters or files or applications um, that are previously filed by somebody else, uh, a law firm, another attorney, and um, may or may not have actions that have a, a something to docket, like sometimes an office action or renewals. Um, so other things to um, look at of a, a trademark file transfer is that we need to figure out what stage of each matter these are in, pending, allowed, or if they're registered. And this last part will come a little uh, useful in future slides. So in this slide, I am going to um, show you examples of fields to update in the docket system. Um, and in this case, it's going to be uh, close to the docket system that I use, which is Foundation IP. So a lot of fields that are important for us to receive um, from the previous counsel or the client is please let us know a status, um, is uh, the mark type, uh, what, what is the mark type so we could put that in our system, docketing system. If you don't happen to know what the mark type is, uh, below there's a little note of where you can go into the USPTO trademark and there's a way where you can figure out what type or mark type this is. Um, your filing basis, date filed, that is very important. The application number, um, the other ones like priority date, priority country and parent date, these are more um, if the application actually claims priority to it. And it also depends on the docketing system that you're working in. Like I said on mine, this one is, um, it's a field that we would have to fill in. Um, the publication date, the custom status. Uh, this custom status is very, very specific to our uh, FIP, and um, it makes sense to us, but it is important for other people that are working in our law firm. It's very important to know if it's registered, if this mark is in use. Uh, has it been allowed? Have we received a notice of allowance? Um, and then registration date and registration number. Now, some of these fields, depending when you fill out the information or date, they can launch due dates. So that's something to look at, depending on what system, docketing system you're working in. Okay, thank you, Z. Well, next month's webinar that I indicated is also directed to trademark file transfers is going to go into a lot more detail about fields like that and the actual data for individual matters. For example, how do you get information if the information you get from previous counsel is incomplete or incorrect? What are good data sources to go to? Those types of things are going to be covered in detail next month because you can spend a whole webinar just on that. But for today, we're going to be focusing on the logistics of how to get the data moved into the system. There's really two, what I would call, methodologies that you could use. The first one is you can manually enter the data into the docketing system, and the second one is you can do some type of electronic data transport or data transfer or data import. So, Z, let's talk a little bit about manual data input as a methodology to get information into your docketing system when you're doing a transfer. So, what is it and how do we do a manual transfer? So, uh, a manual data import is uh, data that is physically entered by an employee into uh, the docketing system that they're working in, and it's information that could it. It could be retrieved by the previous counsel or the client or just a search in the trademark office of each country that you are um, receiving these trademarks from. Um, and how do you do this? How do you do the manual data import? Well, it's uh, preferably you have a checklist 
uh, for me, it's key to work with the checklist and you can do your notes and all that, but having some kind of uh, procedure of how you're going to open these according to the system and the information that you have received is very important. Follow your checklist. Um, and then what, what you want to do is you want to mirror that information received and put it into, into your data system. Uh, and it's not just the information received because you can get uh, reports that have incorrect information. So I would, as a tip, I would always say base yourself off of what you receive from the trademark site. And since we're human beings and we can think out of the box, I would say if you see some kind of discrepancy, always ask um, mm -hmm. the attorney or the paralegal that you're working with to say, hey, this is what I got in the report and this is what I got in the, in the trademark site. And just always making sure that the due dates and deadlines that you have are docketed uh, accordingly and anything that you might find in the trademark sites, always uh, make sure that they are noted in the docketing system that you're working in. So with that said, um, I will tell you the advantages and the disadvantages of the manual data input. Um, after one of the advantage is after matter is set up by the docketer, this one's ready to, to be used. And what do I refer, what does ready to use mean? That is after the docketer completes the opening of the matter, then um, the, the docketer just moves on to the next matter. It's done, I opened it, I feel comfortable that it's open correctly, I already mirrored what I found in the trademark site and I put it into my docketing system. And then it's just ready for the attorney and the paralegal to work in. If there's not like that second review, um, it's just all done at one time. And the disadvantages, well, I did mention that it's an employee that's going to be opening these matters, and the employee is a human person, uh, a human being, so there's going to be human error, you know. Um, but um, with that, it also is they're touching this matter, they're opening a matter one at a time rather than opening a whole bunch of matters in seconds or minutes. So um, there's that time that we're working against. And um, well, it depends on how many transfers you got. It's, it's um, the total time that's going to require your employee to work on this transfer in is depending how much time they're going to take on that very first transfer and so on, and depending how many you got. Um, and I would recommend a senior level of um, of working with these matters because I want them to be um, comfortable and have knowledge towards the trademark sites that they're working and the spreadsheets that they're working on uh, to try to mirror that trademark site with the docketing system that you're working on because it could be that in the spreadsheet there's an incorrect due date and in the trademark search there's another due date and you need to be able to find, oh, but this wasn't in the in the spreadsheet that I received. So um, that knowledge comes very handy when they're opening these matters, um, just so they don't miss any due dates. Well, Z, I'm glad you mentioned that it's important to have a senior level person doing this work because I uh, believe that the process of transferring files in and opening records in the system is one of the most complex tasks that a docketer or a docketing team has to do. When you think about just the daily docketing that docketers handle, correspondence comes in and it typically comes into the docketing department because you know there's something in that document that needs to be updated in the system and you just have to you know, identify what it is. But when you're dealing with file transfers, you don't even know if there's something to update in the system. You mm -hmm. have to, one, figure that out. And then, two, you talked about um, what I would call reconciling information if there's conflicting information. Mm -hmm. So I do think that having a senior level doctor uh, is a very important thing, particularly if you're going to be entering the data manually into the system, because this is a very complex uh, and critical process. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to talk now about the alternative methodology, which would be to do an electronic data import. 
So what do I mean by that? Well, if your data exists, if the docketing information exists already in another electronic docketing system, you can transfer that data from the first electronic system to your docketing system. And you can do that without any manual entry of the data into the docketing system. Typically, you have to work with the vendor for your docketing system. That vendor will get an export of the data from the uh, previous docketing system. And then they'll have to work to figure out how to map the fields from the prior docketing system to the docketing system that the data is going to be moved into. Uh, that process can be time consuming to go through and prepare the mapping and, and do some testing and make sure that you know that the data import is going to work. But then when the data import actually happens, that's done as a batch process and the data imp the data is all brought over and at, at one time. So as opposed to Z's example with the manual docketing where the the data is going to come in matter by matter and basically be done added to the system sequentially, an electronic data import will move the matter the data all over in one batch process and everything's in the system uh right away or maybe if it's a big transfer it might be done over the weekend, but within a within a, a short period of time, once the fields are mapped, the data can be moved over. So thinking about this from the standpoint of advantages and disadvantages, one of the advantages is that uh, all the matters can be ready and available in your docketing system right away after the bulk import completes. And one, one aspect of this that can be very useful is if you're transferring in a a trademark portfolio that has a lot of matters that are still actively in prosecution. You're probably starting to get new docketing coming in that needs to be added to those matters. And if you have a large portfolio with a lot of matters to add to your system, it can be a bit of a juggling act to prioritize to open the correct matters so that the ones that have docketing coming in can get the docketing entered into them. Whereas if you're doing this electronically, all the matters are in there after the bulk data import, and you can start adding that new docketing into them right away. They're available to, to docket into, and that can be one big advantage for a large portfolio. Also, because the data is being moved from a previous system, there's no manual keying in of the data by, by a human being, so you eliminate the the potential for errors that can come from just the typos uh, when you're doing manual data entry. It also doesn't require that you have that senior level experience docketer on your team to, to determine what to put into the system because you're just taking the data from a previous system and moving it over and presumably the data was added correctly into the previous, previous system. And I say presumably because that's not always the case, but if you can make that assumption, you're not going to need the senior level docketer to add the record to the system. The big disadvantage to electronic data import, though, is oftentimes the cost. You typically have a third party who's going to be uh, performing this service, and that's generally the uh, docket system vendor that you use for your own docketing system. And they're they're typically going to charge you and probably charge you quite a bit to move the data over and do the mappings and prep for the conversion and manage the whole process. So it can be quite a costly process. Uh, another thing that's a disadvantage is that if there are errors in the previous docketing system, because remember I said presumably the data was entered uh, and docketed correctly in the previous console system, if there's errors in the previous console system, because nobody's doing that reconciling and analysis as they're entering it into your docketing system. Uh, you're not going to have anybody catching those errors. You're just going to move those over into your system. So I guess the quality of the data that you have available is uh, an important thing to think about. And then finally, you often are not done after the electronic data import when that batch import completes, oftentimes you still need to do what I would call a second pass and go through all the records individually to review them and potentially clean them up after the bulk import. One thing that often happens is deadlines will launch 
when you do that bulk import that may be past due and need to go in and be completed. So, for example, many docketing systems will have deadlines that will launch off of, let's say, a filing date field or a registration date field. When those fields are populated as part of the bulk import, that can sometimes trigger, uh, based on the country law and the system, new deadlines to launch in, in your system. And oftentimes those deadlines that launch are deadlines that were completed in the previous docketing system, but because they launched based on your country law and your system just off the population of those date fields, it's very likely that you can have a lot of past due deadlines that are going to be cluttering up your docket. And somebody just needs to go through and, and clean those up, and that can be a little bit time consuming. So given those two methodologies, how do you decide which which approach to take if you're in a position where you do have the option of either approach. There's a lot of things to consider and there's no one right answer or master checklist that or master set of questions that you can answer and it will say do it this way or do it that way. It's a balancing act and there's a lot of things to consider. One of those being the resources that you have available both on the financial side for the cost as well as the personnel. Z talked a lot about having an experienced docketer for um, a manual, uh, a manually handled uh, portfolio transfer. If you don't have that level of experience on your team, that's a consideration. If uh, your docketers are not necessarily um, the the fastest, that's a consideration. So just what do you have for available resources on the personnel side is an important thing to consider. Then the number of matters is also an important thing to consider. If you have only 50 matters that are being transferred in, you may look at that different than if you have 500 matters or even 5,000 matters. Now, the number of matters, though, can be relative to your number of resources. Maybe you have 5,000 matters, but you have a fairly big docketing staff and you have the right resources. It might still make sense to do that manually as opposed to electronically if you have the right resources available. Another thing to consider is the format of the data. If it is already in an electronic format and it's in good condition, that will lean towards doing an electronic import. But sometimes you still run into people that have paper files and you have to scan the documents and you don't even have the option to bring the data in electronically. Uh, cost is a big consideration and I kind of covered that under the financial resources already. And then your client preferences and your client needs need to be considered in advance too. If you have a client that has special reporting requirements periodically, uh, you need to make sure you can have the data in the system in a timely fashion to be able to provide the reporting requirement or meet the reporting requirements that they have, let's say quarterly or annually. Uh, if you're in a corporation, your business uh, unit may be getting close to their annual budgeting period. And you know that there's a lot of information that they're going to want to know to project costs over the next the next year or the next budget cycle. Uh, and they're going to be needing detailed detailed reports to help them with that. So whatever the context is, you know, what are the the needs that your client is going to have and how soon is that going to come up and will you be able to have the information in the system quick enough to be able to meet those client needs? Uh, just overall time constraints as well, and then uh, the completeness of the, the list of matters and the matter data that you receive. If the data is electronic but it's incomplete and you're still going to have to go out and verify against public trademark office data, then you may just need to do it manually. Uh, also, the status of the matters can be can be a factor too. If you have a lot of matters that are registered versus matters that are still pending, that might make a difference in, in the approach that, that you take just because of the complexity of the docketing or simplicity, however you look at it, that needs to be done. So there's a number of things to take into account. And the best way to help illustrate how you make those decisions, I think, is to talk about some examples of file transfers that this group has, has handled. So, Z, I'm going to let you talk about a couple. I'll turn this back to you. Okay. So, um, 
Ann just mentioned in her previous slide about resources. And I am actually uh, lucky to count uh, with resources on the personal side. Um, for this particular case that I'm gonna share with you, um, I had two amazing docketers that were fast and they used their common sense in, in this specific uh, transfer in project and any other transfer in project that they have their hands in. And luckily, I still have these senior docketers in my in my team. So shout out to my docketing team. But um, I will say that in this particular case, we had 5,000 plus matters, and they, the status was all over the place, um, pending, allowed, registered, and um, along the way, it did end up being more than 5,000 matters and it was for 35 different clients. And um, these physical files needed to be scanned and uploaded, entered into our system. Um, we did use some um, attempts to help us. Uh, we try to, I try to be very resourceful in asking people if they can help me out uh, because the amount of files coming in were really big. But um, we did find out while receiving variety of reports that some of these reports had er errors and some of them were like they would say that they were abandoned but then you would go into the trademark country site and then it what what you were looking at it didn't quite seem to match the report that you had received so uh, there was a lot of common sense that needed to be used in in some of those matters um, and then what happened once you we, um, with the amount of uh, reports that we received and the amount of clients um, that they all want their matters to be done, we have to prioritize. You need to organize yourself uh, well. And what we did is, okay, you're going to open the matters that have due dates and deadlines coming up. And um, after that, go through with status. Do the pending first, do the, um, the ones that are allowed and then registered towards the end. Um, so it's about uh, prior, we had to prioritize a lot. And at the same time, there were other transferred ins that were also being handled at the same time. Um, all of this took us like 11 months um, of getting all of these matters open. And then in the meantime, when you're working with them, you get new reports that you need to work on. So um, that's, 11 months, I don't think it's that bad. For That's, that was a large transfer in. So if I take a look at what you just talked about, that was a large transfer in, over 5,000 files, and normally you would think, well, that would make you lean towards doing it electronically. But you had good resources available that would allow you to do it manually. You wanted some additional review of the data. Uh, and that also lends itself to doing it manually. And finally, the format of the data, it wasn't all electronic. You had those things that had to be filed. So even though there was a lot of files, that in and of itself wasn't the only factor, and the other factors actually led you to choose to do it manually, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's a great example. And I know you told me when we were preparing that in the beginning you were evaluating, should we do it electronic or manual? Would you do it different now that you've been through it? No. Uh, yeah, definitely not. Um, okay. Yes. Good. All right. Uh, tell us about another one. So the second case study is uh, we had 900 U.S. matters that needed to be, um, that were all registered and they needed to be open in our system. So um, 800 were like original files. And for our system, it, uh, our docketing system, it is important. It is important how we um, how we number them. So um, if we had them all open electronically, all of them would end up with a US one. And a hundred of those nine hundred matters, they were they had to be open as a US two. Uh, but because we received a report so nice. Um, and it it was easily um, it was easy for us to be able to remove those US twos or continuations or divisionals. Um, it it made it easy. Um, we're not always lucky to receive these kind of reports, 
So what we did is 800 matters were automatically open. They were scraped from the USPTO, and then 100 of them were open manually. Um, like I said, just because of the numbering system that we have. If not, I would have just gotten all 900 matters um, opened electronically. And this one took us about two weeks. So this is an interesting one, too, because the number of matters is a lot less. It's about 20% uh, of the number of matters on the compared to the 5,000 that you did uh, manually. But that wasn't the, the key thing. It sounds like the key factors that allowed you to go electronic with this one was you had good data. Uh, mm -hmm. The spreadsheet had good data. It was in a, it was in a clean format. And uh, the status also was a factor. There mm -hmm. were so many of them that were at the registered status, and that was an easy status to bring in electronically. So in that case, those two factors played more heavily into the decision, right? Mm -hmm. And that's pretty cool. You got 900 matters into a system in two weeks. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. All right, I'll talk about the next example. This is an example where the transfer was handled with an electronic data uh, import. In this case, there was a portfolio of 1,800 uh, matters. These were worldwide and all statuses. This, In this instance, the data was being moved from one CPI system to another CPI system. So the matters were being transferred from one law firm to another law firm. Both law firms had CPI. So we we're going to so we moved the data from previous counsel's CPI system to new counsel's CPI system, and uh, had to go through that process of mapping the fields. You would think CPI and CPI are the same, but it's not always the case. So there was a process to do the mapping of the fields for the data import, and then when the actual data import happened, it was a bulk update that was done over the weekend. Um, so after that, though, there was quite a bit of time, actually many months, spent manually reviewing and verifying and cleaning up the data in the new CPI system. So uh, one thing that that sometimes happens when you're doing your mappings is if your actions or tasks or activities, whatever you call them in your particular docketing system, are different between the two systems, you don't necessarily map the old action with the country law into the new action, you typically just move the deadline over as a static deadline. When you do that, the new deadlines, nothing launches off of it. It's not a smart um, thing. So, so in this case, we had to go through and make sure um, you know the, the existing deadlines moved over correctly, and they did, and that worked quite well but new deadlines that needed to be launched had to be added. Some fields didn't come always come over correctly, like, um, uh, well, I can't remember which ones, but there were a few instances where the uh, there were differences in fields between the two systems, and so we had to do a little bit of cleanup on that. No fault of CPI, it was just the way the, the fields differed. Uh, and some things we had to add, for example, like status checks and things that we needed to add in that were that were a different docketing policy in the new firm system. So the good news was, and what worked really well about this one was the deadlines uh, were the existing deadlines from the previous system were immediately available when that bulk import happened as part of that process. So they could run docket reports on their existing deadlines. The bad news was because of the size, it did take quite a while, and it took senior level resources to go through and do the the follow up and the cleanup process. So again, the things we looked at in this case were um, the large number of files. 1,800 files was quite substantial. We looked at the format of the data. It was already in CPI, and it was in good you know, good clean format. And then we looked at the status and the status being, you know, a large number of active prosecution cases where uh, we knew we were going to need to be able to dock it into them right away and wanted to get them moved over quickly. So those are three examples between myself and Z. Uh, Ellen, I'd like to have you talk about, can you share some, uh, some of your experience in handling file transfers for trademarks? Sure, Anne, thank you. Um, we did many smaller acquisitions, and so, of course, those are relatively easy to do. You just would probably rather do those 
manually for all the reasons that both you and Z have mentioned previously. Um, it, because we were a small number, we could afford the time to make sure that we just went through them all individually and made sure everything was in our system correctly the way we liked it to be, double check things with the um, with whatever trademark office was appropriate. And that's always great if you can afford the time and have the personnel. The, um, the biggest one we did was when we decided to bring trademark prosecution in-house from our outside counsel. And our outside counsel was excellent and um, had excellent records, but they used a different docketing system. And as you ladies have mentioned, um, we decided because of the volume, because we were a small office and didn't have uh, lots of personnel available to help with docketing, to do the transfer electronically. It worked, it worked pretty well. That was fine. Um, and we were able, once the transfer was done, to just jump in, as you were saying, and, and immediately start working and not have to do, uh, worry about um, <clears throat> wondering if we were missing a deadline or anything like that, because they were all in there. And we didn't have to do um, very much cleanup on the opposite end, so that was a good experience for us, unlike the last situation you just mentioned. I would say that the, um, the point, though, that just to uh, reemphasize the point you made previously, which is, it takes a lot of work up front, and it is amazing to think that it should be so, you think it's so easy to, to just map things, I mean, a registration number is a registration number, how hard can it be? But every system, docking system is different, and every docking system has its little idiosyncrasies, and preparing all the mapping took a lot of time for our in-house personnel, and a lot of time from the um, uh, outside docking personnel for the docking system. And it was expensive when we got them involved and we're having to, as you said, run tests and things like that. It was expensive. Uh, we didn't really have a choice because of the volume and our limited personnel. But I think that uh, most people would be surprised that that is an expense and uh, that it's so time consuming to do all of that work up front just to get things mapped over. And even then, there may be small or minor things you have to work on. But um, if you do all that work up front and you're able to have the financial resources to do that, I think it's great. I know some people have, um, uh, Julie's going to talk about a situation she had that was thankfully different, <laughs> um, which is great. But um, these are just all things to consider when you are looking at transferring in large volumes. And um, every situation is going to be different. And as Dee mentioned, you know, sometimes you go back and say, yeah, even though this was maybe not perfect, I would still do it the same way. And other times, maybe you learn from your experiences. So I assume, would you do that one the same way? Yes, we didn't really have a choice. We would have had to hire outside personnel and um, goodness knows how, you know, we wouldn't have known. We wouldn't even had anyone to really properly supervise them. So we wouldn't have known if they were doing things correctly and we probably would end up with a bigger mess on our hands. Yeah, I bet so. And actually your comment about hiring outside personnel, I know it's scary, but sometimes I hear people who are considering hiring temps to do uh, the data entry on transfer in yeah. projects. And I would Definitely highly, <laughs> highly discourage yeah. that. I just don't see that coming out well, but you know, people well, are- Well, I think that comes from people who don't understand that- Right, people who don't understand that this is not data entry, that it's more than that, as these ladies have emphasized. It's, you know, straight data entry, you might be fine with um, with just temps, but docketing is its own specialty. And if you really don't understand what you're doing or why you're doing it, or know when something is an issue or know to double check something, then you're going to end up with a bigger mess on your hands. Absolutely. Well said. Julie, tell us about your experiences with transfers. So most of my experience comes from working in the corporate setting. And the majority of time, uh, we had small batches of files that we had to add to our docketing system due to, you know, there were many different reasons, multiple Madrid filings that had to be opened, or there was the onboarding of new records due to an acquisition or something like that. And by small batches, I mean maybe 50 to 100 records, maybe more. But um, we always did those manually simply because we had the personnel to do it. And um, we had the personnel to enter uh, the data manually and to do um, a decent review. And so it just wasn't worth paying our docketing system vendor to do that for us. There were two instances, however, uh, in which we migrated our entire portfolio to a new docketing system. And I think at the time, that portfolio was about 2,500 active cases. 
And so in that instance, in, in both of those instances, we relied on the, the new vendors' abilities to upload those records en masse uh, to their systems using CSV spreadsheets. And the first time that we, we did it, it was kind of a nightmare. Um, we didn't do an adequate amount of preparation before they actually transferred the files over, and we ended up not completely trusting the data that was uploaded. Um, so we had to spend an inordinate amount of time reviewing each record for accuracy, correcting data in the fields, et cetera. So we felt that every record needed to be meticulously reviewed after it was over. Um, the second time that we transferred the files to a new system, we used our first experience um, as an example of what not to do. And so the second time, we spent a great deal of time with the vendor mapping out fields. Uh, we changed the names of fields to what we wanted them to be. We changed the names of tabs and sections uh, to what we wanted them to be and got rid of the ones that we, we knew we wouldn't use. Um, we tested a lot of the action codes uh, to see what they would generate, and we altered them based on what we wanted to see on the docket. Um, we uploaded, um, or actually we, we weeded out a lot of the, the contacts that we no longer needed or that were repetitive, like um, outside counsel, foreign agents, and other contacts that were just uh, extraneous in the system. And we made sure that the entire database had been reviewed beforehand and that all the deadlines were accurate and up to date and everything like that. So we did a lot of due diligence on our system uh, before we um, did the transfer. So um, yeah, so the second time around we did all that cleanup and review and we did a lot of pre-planning and preparation on the new system. Uh, before we flipped the switch, so to speak. And as a result, we could tell that the information in the new system was more accurate or cleaner, uh, if you will, than it had been the first time that we did a migration. The first time, uh, as I said, we didn't trust the data at all because there was so much about that migration that had not gone well or, or was unexpected. I mean, there was data in wrong fields and generic action codes populated and you know, so the second time we, we could see that the data was in the right fields and that all of the dates were generating correctly, and, and so we felt much more better about it. Um, we may have spent a lot more time with the setup the second time around, but we did not spend nearly as much time on review on the back end afterward, and not nearly as many corrections were needed. So in the long run, uh, we all felt that it was more cost effective and less time consuming to do all the prep work beforehand rather than to try and fix everything after it was over. And I don't recall our vendor, our new vendor, even charging us extra for most of that prep work that we did. Um, we may have paid, in fact, I know that we, we paid for an extra visit for them to come to our office to do an extra mapping session. It was like an all day mapping session. Um, we did pay extra for that, but otherwise, I believe it was everything else was covered in our contract with them, including uh, training on the new system. And so um, there were some challenges uh, with taking so much time to plan and prep in the sense that we, we did have to answer to corporate executives regarding budget timing issues and why it was taking longer than anticipated. But in the end, um, I think it was generally acknowledged that it had been worth it to to do so much prepping and planning uh, in, in initially before doing the data transfer. Well, thank you, Julie. That was a great example and uh, just your experience of one that worked well and well, one that didn't work well, and then one that did, and what you did differently. It was it was great to hear. Um, every situation is going to be different, obviously, uh, but the thing that I'm hearing as a theme here and as a takeaway is that uh, these things are going to take time, whether it's time on the front end to map out the fields and test things and get, get everything prepped so that it can be imported electronically uh, and have that data import go very smoothly, or whether it's doing it manually and just the amount of time, like in Z's example, the 11 months to get the 5,000 plus files into a system, or even time when you do a data import and then you have to do cleanup on the back end. But 
in all examples, uh, you need to recognize that you're going to have to plan quite a bit of time when you're dealing with a transfer in of a portfolio. And at the end of the day, the most important thing for everybody is to be able to trust the data that goes into the system. Um, and that's where you can take these things into consideration from that that checklist a few slides back and, and determine what uh, is going to give you the most um, confidence in the data, uh, just based on what you have for resources, number of matters, format of the data, timing constraints, status of the data. All of that needs to be taken into account and evaluated and weighed so you can pick the methodology that's going to be the best for your particular situation and give you data that at the end you can have confidence in because that's the critical thing. I just want to remind everybody that um, if you have questions on today's program, you can submit those questions in the question box in the control panel. Also, if you have questions about Black Hills IP services or processes, please contact Jim Brophy. His contact information is on, on the screen. Um, and so again, we'll take a minute just to see if anybody has questions, but today we've talked about docketing options for managing the transfer of a trademark portfolio and specifically focused on the, the logistics of getting the data into the system. We will be posting the slides and the audio recording of today's program on our website. Uh, you go to the educational resources tab of uh, blackhillsip.com and you'll be able to access the slides and the audio recording. Give us a couple of days to get those posted, but we'll get those posted as quickly as we can. I don't see any questions, so I just have one final announcement, and that is the next webinar in this series is called Tips for Managing the Manual Entry of a Transferred Trademark Portfolio. So this is the one where we're going to focus on if you're going to put the data in yourself, how do you get it, what sources do you use, how do you fill in gaps in your data or uh, verify that the data is correct. We'll go into that in, in quite a bit of detail. That program will be on September 12th at 1 p.m. Central Time. You can register for that program also through our website and also under the Educational Resources tab. So I'd like to thank our panelists today for participating and sharing their experiences. And I hope that as um, audience members, you'll join us for the next trademark webinar in a month and for other webinars in our Docketing Excellence webinar series. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day.